We want to give thanks for all those who have greeted us throughout the year now past on Sunday mornings, just said hello to us when we've come in, shaken our hands, as well as those who have provided the, the, the flowers from week to week that decorate and beautify our worship space. Thank you very much for that. And also to those who, in the media, I, know, I never know if I say that correctly, uh, just record our services and provide me with this microphone. Thank you very much. In welcoming you as well, I just want to mention that we received a kind letter from uh, staff leadership in our denomination telling us that they'd prayed for us as a congregation this past week. And that's always encouraging to know that others are praying for us. So I thought I'd share that with you this morning as well. And then to our meat pies. So that was a kind of little interactive piece there. Our meat pies. It's that time of year again to order your meat pies. They're turkey pies, rather. And you've been asked to let Vera or Donna know. By February 10th, that would be... Yes, I'm going to mention that. Thank you. So you'll hear it twice now. Thank you very much, Sharon. Uh, by February 10th, that would be next Sunday, just let Vera and Donna know how much you would like, how many you would like. And they are 350, as Sharon has mentioned, per pie. I believe that's all the announcements. Is there any other? Okay. This week's prayer request as we go to a time of prayer and music is for the deacons who lead our congregation. Let us worship God. Our call to worship this morning is a responsive call to worship. There are a couple of other responsive readings as well this morning. Verses from Psalm 95. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. For he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture and, and the sheep, sheep of his, of his hand. hand. Our first hymn today is number 647 in your books. We have come to join in worship. The music, the hymns this morning have been chosen, selected by Diana Arthur. And uh, thank you for, for that. Um, please join me and we have come to join in worship. Please stand if you're able. We have come to join in worship and adore the Lord our God. Let us come in prayer expecting God to speak his mighty word. All his being unless the spirit of the Holy One comes down. Christians pray. Be his gospel, let it say. 
us love our God supremely. Let us love each other too. Let us care for all His people till our God makes all things new. Christ will. Christ himself will rise and serve us, living man all around. Let us remain standing for prayer. Let us pray. Since you are closer to us than the air we breathe and are our pole star, our guide, the one who guards us against the snares of the world, our temptations that come from within. We ask you to help us to put to rest our fears, O God, that we may adore you now and serve you forever. Amen. Please be seated. And let us resolve to live just as we have been taught to pray, saying, let us pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is taken from Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 4 to 10. The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Alas, sovereign Lord, I said, I do not know how to speak. I am too young. But the Lord said to me, Do not say I am too young. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. <clears throat> then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, I have put my words in your mouth. See? Today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. And reading responsively from Psalm 71. In you, O Lord, I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me and rescue me. Incline your ear to me and save me. Be to me a rock of refuge, a strong fortress, to save me. For you are my rock and my fortress. Rescue, rescue me, O oh my God, God from, from the hand of the wicked, from, from the, the grasp of the unjust and cruel. For you, O oh Lord, are my hope, my trust, O oh Lord, from my youth. Upon you I have leaned from my birth. It was you who took me from my mother's womb. My praise is continually of you. Be to me a rock of refuge, a strong fortress to save me, for you are my rock and my fortress. Shed for me, and that thou be. 
Just as I am, though tossed about with many a conflict, many a doubt, fightings and fears within, without a lamb of God, I come, I come. Just as In our prayer, our hearts go out to you, O divine love, as we give thanks for your patient forgiveness of sin, your grace that saves, your faith in us that overflows in the gratitude we express today. In our prayer also, our hearts go out to others, as we pray for nations and individuals, snared in debt for communities struggling to serve the powerless school divisions and all who seek to serve the least of these are children remembering those who are stretched those whose lives are a constant struggle to shore up the gaps fill the holes in their pantries make choices between heating their dwellings or eating as we pray for those ensnared by poor choices, by addictions, by horrific childhoods, or those whose wills seem to have been given over to our adversary, as well as those behind bars, justly or unjustly, all who are captives. Praying again for the blind, the deaf, the paralyzed, the chronically ill, the misdiagnosed and the undiagnosed, those despairing, those oppressed, the oppressors. For all these and others, O oh, you who came to us and the one who was given to proclaim the acceptable year of your favor, we pray. As we ask you to let debts and financial barriers be swept away, to appoint us all to bring good news to the deprived, the struggling, the underemployed, to call us to work for the undoing of the system that crushes, that your will may be seen to be done, that an end to the struggle may be brought, that into being might come the universal restoration of all things, that jubilee of our Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. It's long been held that the only human-made feature visible on earth from outer space is, space is the Great Wall of China. But in a NASA town hall in 2013, astronaut John Grunsfeld drew attention to how the borders between rich countries and poor countries are now and also visible from outer space. Stating, wealthy countries are lined in green and then you see the country next door that has no water. A statement Grunsfeld was well qualified to make after five trips into outer space over the span of 14 years, three of which visits to space. He also looked through the Hubble Space Telescope. So these trips gave him ample opportunity to see how the planet had changed with more forests being cleared and more rivers being dammed and poorer countries having fewer trees. So he concluded it's really very disturbing. And of course that kind of an, could be an unpopular kind of statement just as what we will shortly read in Luke chapter 4 could be considered one of Jesus' more unpopular statements. 
as he talked about God's program being aimed to help the poor and the disabled and has given us to proclaim good news to the poor and the year of debt relief known as the Jubilee as the heart and the hands and the face of Jesus this is the task that we've been given as we recognize the disparity between the poor and the rich and I invite you to keep that in mind as we give our offerings to God and ushers come forward for prayer. Let us pray. God, who would help us to live in ways that can relieve the burdens of others, liberate those ensnared in oppression, further your good news to the poor. Please enable us to continue on this journey of faithfulness by seeing where our time and our talents should be applied. In the name of the Christ, amen.
Our next scripture is taking, taken from Luke chapter 4, verses 21 to 30. <clears throat> he began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son, they asked? Yeah. Jesus said to them, Surely you will quote this proverb to me, Physician, heal yourself. And you will tell me, Do hear in your hometown what we have heard that you did in Capernaum. Truly I tell you, he continued, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet, yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of the town, and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. As I'm sure some of you thought during the just, uh, just as I am, that is one that brings back some memories about baptisms. And it was a memory for Diana for her own baptism and her mom's before her. Um, we're going to be singing a love to tell the story. And Diana said, as you see, I love old favorites. I hope they're ref reflective of ordinary people witnessing, teaching, obeying, and trusting. Our charitable actions will be our story as Christians. Let us tell the story through song, and I love to tell the story. Please join me. It's number 560 in your books, and the words will be on the screen. Please stand if you're able. See 
talk about awakening to God's call because that is part of what the call of Jeremiah the prophet in our text suggests to me with my first in-depth look at this truly great prophet coming during the course of a survey of the Old Testament given by Dr. Raymond Hobbs one of my professors at seminary in OT 1A3 the name of the course I just mentioned, Dr. Hobbes not only introduced us to the nature of the literature of the Old Testament, its history, background, and contribution to faith, but also introduced us to the study of the words of the prophets, their stirring and inspired pronouncements of judgment and hope, with Dr. Hobbes commenting that great Poetic writers in any age, though they may be, the prophets were not primarily poets. Then going on to introduce us to the probable context in which the prophets worked, as the notes I had taken still inform me. Though he did not so much subscribe to the common view that the 8th to the 6th centuries before the coming of the Christ were a golden age as they were a culminative period in which the measure of a prophet could be concluded from the way a prophet conformed to the mosaic ideal of the times. And of course we can't go into that this morning. And of course Dr. Hobbes introduced us to a number of the big ideas the prophets of the day set forth. Their ideas, if you will, about God or their theology and how this moved them. It was an altogether engrossing course of study in the middle of which Dr. Hobbes one day said that all we know about one prophet in particular is his name. A remark that alerted me to how little we actually do know by way of a prophet's background or upbringing or where they have come from as well as what they were doing before they became a prophet. There being one or two exceptions to that rule, though Jeremiah is not one of those exceptions. Because all that we know about Jeremiah prior to his call was that he was but a youth when he sensed or heard that call. So when you try to look into the familial ties of which he must have been a part, before he became a prophet, you will scarcely find out anything about his origins. While one enterprising commentator I was reading just this past week managed two pages of what I would call speculation regarding that prophet about whom all we really know is his name, Micah of Morasheth. Thus did Dr. Hobbes' Old Testament survey introduce me to how little we actually know. But all of those things we may deem to be important if we are to properly understand a prophet's writings, as well as alerted me to how any attempt to delve into a prophet's upbringing almost inevitably leads to speculation, as we may seek to unearth any such implications in their writings. The three-volume, 2,700-page biography on Winston Churchill I am currently reading, about 10 minutes a night over the last year, serving to indicate just how important we think such things are in understanding what makes a person tick. The author is going all the way back to the beginning of the 19th century to illustrate their contention that Churchill's personal and political journey, which began in 1874 and ended in 1965, mirrored that of the British Empire at its height and in its eventual disappearance. The sort of detailed approach I think that a lot of us 
would think the best way to get a handle on who a person really is and what a person is all about. As in my own family, my mother has a knack for unearthing little known facts and stories about individuals in our own family tree and sharing what she has learned with the rest of us. All that we have said thus far, making it all the more striking how we are given next to nothing to go on when it comes to Jeremiah the prophet. Such that apart from Anatoth where he bought a field, as we later learn in the book, where did he come from anyway? And if none of all that stuff we would deem to be important holds much importance in his writings, what does? All of which, in turn, brings us to the first verses of the book of Jeremiah, a long way round, as a clue to the book of Jeremiah and as a clue to the understanding of what might be of most importance regarding the prophet himself. Because it is there that we read of how the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah when he was but a youth. And of how this call of God in which he hears that he has been chosen in utero to be a prophet to the nations is really what gets his story going. Taking us all the way back to Dr. Hobbes' comments about how little we actually know about the prophets themselves from their own writings, things like what their youthful inclinations and aspirations might have been, stuff like that. All those things they had been doing prior to their call. Other than the call they received when they became a prophet, in Jeremiah's case, a call he wasn't particularly thrilled to embrace as our text details his protestations. Yet a calling God wasn't about to let up on, as our text also shows. That interaction between God and Jeremiah telling us how being a prophet or spokesperson for God was certainly not Jeremiah's idea, but rather God's. Which is just the way I think it can work between us and God. Because though there are those who have told me that they don't believe in the call, I do think that most of us would subscribe to how all of us are called to be something or someone we would not otherwise have been without God's call. Just as you're called to be a disciple or follower of Jesus Christ had more or has more to do with what God in Christ had or has in mind for you than the other way around. Or maybe I'm just mincing words. But I think this is the crux of the matter. Because if the life we are living is really and only up to us, and our relationship to God is really and only dependent upon having the right family, the right spiritual attitude, the right desire to be as close to God as we can possibly get, then where actually does God and God's call come into it? Raising further how the life you are living may not necessarily be your own, just as your relationship with God may not be based upon all of the other things you may think to be so important, but rather on God and perhaps solely on God. The conversion of C.S. Lewis, whose writings we have heard from a couple of times this past year on Sunday mornings, giving to us an example. In his autobiography, Surprised by Joy, C.S. Lewis talks about his journey from atheism to believing fully, if I can put it that way, in the Christian faith. And he speaks of it in terms of the way God 
came to him and so called out to him and not the other way around. He shares, all my waitings and watchings for joy had been a futile attempt to contemplate the enjoyed. And then he goes on to describe what happened to him in this way. The odd thing was that before God closed in on me, I was in fact offered what now appears a moment of holy free choice. I was going up Headington Hill on the top of a bus Without words, and I think almost without images, a fact about myself was somehow presented to me. I became aware that I was holding something at bay or shutting something out. It's interesting how he talks about God closing in on me. Quite the way of putting it. After which, Lewis tells us how he sought to resist the God who was steadily closing in on him. Much like the way Jeremiah the prophet sought to hold God back by asking God to let up on his call. With C.S. Lewis rounding his story off by inviting us to picture him hard at work in his professorial digs at Oxford, while with every pause in his labors, he became increasingly aware of, and I quote, the steadily, steady, unrelenting approach of him whom I so earnestly desired not to meet. Until that which he greatly feared had at last come upon him, and he could write, in the Trinity term of 1929, I gave in and admitted that God was God, and knelt and prayed, perhaps that night the most dejected and reluctant convert in all of England. Quite the conversion, quite the way of describing the call of God, yet something with which at least a few of us here can identify, I'm sure. As we can appreciate how Jeremiah sought to hold off on God and on God's call to his prophetic vacation. And as we can also appreciate how C.S. Lewis and Jeremiah's stories are not so much stories about people who are out there looking for something more in their lives during the course of which they somehow find God as they are stories about people really rather resistantly trying to hold off the approaches and calls of a God who would summon us to do the sorts of things God would want us to do before ever we might think of them. So in awakening to God's call, I'm simply suggesting that we take into account how the stories of our walks with God begin with the way the word of the Lord comes to us. And we then respond. Because in your life and mine, just as in Jeremiah's and C.S. Lewis's, it may very well be that things really get going when the word of the Lord comes to us and we respond. Let us pray. It is you who has made us, O God, and not we ourselves. So we recognize that the summons to work for you comes directly from you. Before ever it is based upon any inherent strengths and talents we may have as recipients of your call. Therefore help us to see that our relationship to you rests upon you just as we ask you to enable our response through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us break bread together on our knees. Let us break bread together on our knees. When I fall on my knees with my face to the rising sun, Let us drink wine together on our knees. Let us drink wine together on our knees. When I fall on my knees with my face to the rising
rising sun. Oh Lord, have mercy on me. Let us praise God together on our knees. Let us praise God together Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If those who hear my voice open the door, I will come into them and eat with them, and they with me. And in the Psalms we read, O taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are all who find refuge in God. We have come together in this way in obedience to our Lord's command and in the recognition that all who are seeking the will of the Christ for their lives may come. Because this is not our table, but the table of our Lord. And he would meet with us here. Let us pray. We gather in your name, dear Lord, because you have told us that wherever two or three are gathered in your name, there are you also. So we ask you to bless us with your presence and in the sharing of the bread and the cup. Show us how we may live close to you and to others. In your name. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, after supper, he took the cup and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us worship God as we are led in prayer by Karen. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we remember you and the sacrifice you made as we take this bread and as we take this drink. Help us to listen to your voice, to hear you as you call to us, and to know what you would have us do in this world. In your name we pray. Amen. Jesus. This is my body, which is for you.
eat of this bread in remembrance of Christ's body broken for you. I, the Lord of sea and sky, I have heard my people cry, all who dwell in dark and sin, my hand will save. I, who made the stars of night, I will make their darkness bright. Who will hear my light to them? Whom shall I send? Here I am, Lord. Is it I, Lord? I have heard you calling in the We have a responsive benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. To shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.